The paragraphs, you say, were all inserted? They were, madam. All excellent forgeries, if I do say so myself. And did you circulate the report of Lady Brittle's intrigue with Captain Bostock? So assiduously, your ladyship, that I think it must breach Mrs. Clackett's ears within four and twenty hours, and then you know the business is as good as done. Mrs. Clackett has a very pretty talent and a great deal of industry. True, madam, and the spoils to prove it. To my knowledge, she has been the cause of six matches being broken off and three sons disinherited, of nine forced elopements, and two divorces. She indeed shows reasonably efficient in the art of gossip, but her manner is gross. True again. She wants that delicacy of hint and mellowness of sneer which distinguish your ladyship's scandal. You are partial snake. Not in the least. Everybody allows that Lady Sneerwell can do more with a look than many can with the most labored detail, even when the truth is on their side. Tis a talent dearly purchased, wounded myself in the early part of my life by the envenomed tongue of slander. I confess I have since no no pleasure equal to the reducing others to the level of my own injured reputation. Nothing can be more natural. But, Lady Sneerwell, there is one affair in which you have lately employed me wherein I am at a loss to guess your motives. You mean with respect to my neighbor, Sir Peter Teasel, and his family? I do. Here are two young brothers, Joseph and Charles Surface, to whom Sir Peter has acted as a kind of guardian since their father's death. The elder Joseph, possessing the most amiable character and universally well spoken of. The younger Charles, the most dissipated and extravagant young fellow in the kingdom. It is utterly unaccountable to me why you, the widow of a city knight with a good jointure, should not yield to the passionate addresses of a man of such good character and reputation as Mr. Joseph. And moreover, why you should be so zealous to destroy the mutual attachment between his profligate brother Charles and Sir Peter's ward, Mariah. I assure you, Snake, that love has no share in the relationship between Joseph, Surface, and me. No. His real attachment is to Mariah, or rather her fortune. But finding in Mariah's heart a preference for his younger brother, Charles, he's been obliged to mask his pretensions and profit by my assistance. But if you do not love Mr. Joseph, why should you involve yourself in his pursuit of the little heiress? How dull you are. Cannot you surmise the weakness I have hitherto concealed even from you? Must I confess that it is Charles, that libertine, that extravagant, whom I love. Your allegiance to Mr. Joseph then is but conveniency. We are united in a goodly cause, that is to prevent the union of Charles and Mariah. If our endeavor succeed, then Joseph shall in time obtain Mariah's dowry. And, and you shall have Charles for yourself. Just so. Well, madam, I must say that comprehension of a sin makes the transgression all the sweeter. At last, I understand why you bade me spread rumors throughout the town of a scandalous affair between Charles Surface and his guardian's pretty young wife, Lady Teasel. <laughs> There's no cure for foolish young love like the aged wisdom of scandal. Mr. Joseph Surface. Show him up. He generally calls about this time. I don't wonder people assume he's my lover. My dear Lady Sneerwell, how do you do today? Mr. Snake, your most obedient. Dear Joseph, your timing is impeccable. Tell me when you last saw your mistress, Mariah, or what is more material to me, when your brother Charles last saw her. I have not seen her since I left you yesterday, but I can inform you that Charles and Mariah meet no more. Some of your stories of his amorous designs on Lady Teasel have taken a good effect on her. Ah, oh, my dear snake, the merit of this belongs to you. But do your brother's distresses increase? Every hour. I am told his debts have now surpassed 4,000 pounds. Poor Charles. It is certainly charity to rescue Mariah from such a libertine, who, if he is to be reformed, can be so only by a person of your ladyship's superior understanding. I believe, Lady Sneerwell, there's company coming. I'll go and compose the letters you wished me. Mr. Joseph, your most obedient. Lady Sneerwell, I am sorry you have put any further confidence in that fellow. Why so? I have lately detected him in frequent conference with old Rowley, who was formerly my father's steward, and has never, you know, been a friend of mine. You think Snake would betray us? Nothing more likely. The fellow hasn't virtue enough to be faithful even to his own villain. Ha! Mariah! Mariah, my dear, how do you do? What's the matter? 
that horrid suitor of mine, Sir Benjamin Backbite, has just called at my guardians with his odious Uncle Crabtree. I slipped out and ran hither to avoid them. Is that all? If my brother Charles had been of the party, madam, perhaps you would not have been so much alarmed. If your brother Charles had been of the party, sir, perhaps I should have fled the sooner. And quite right you would have been too, my dear, for that dastardly rake deserves not another fraction of a minute of your time. But what has Sir Benjamin done that you should avoid him so? Nay, he has done nothing. He has only talked. His conversation is the perpetual libeling of all his acquaintance. Aye, and the worst of it is there is no advantage in not knowing him, for he'll abuse a stranger just as soon as a friend. Nay, but we should make allowance. Sir Benjamin is a wit and a poet. I confess, wit loses its respect with me when I see it in company with malice. What do you think, Mr. Surface? Certainly, madam. To smile at the jest which plants a thorn in another's breast is to become a principal in the mischief. There's no possibility of being witty without a little ill nature. The malice of a good thing is the barb that makes it stick. Madam, Mrs. Candor is below, and if your ladyship is at leisure, we'll leave her carriage. Beg her to walk in. Now, Maria, here is a character to your taste, for though Mrs. Candor is a little talkative, everybody allows her to be the best-natured sort of woman. Oh, yes, with a very gross affectation of good nature, she does more mischief than the direct malice of old Crabtree. <laughs> Faith, that's true. Whenever I hear slanderous accusations against my friends, I never think them in such danger as when Candor undertakes their defense. Hush, here she is. My dear Lady Sneerwell, how have you been this century? Mr. Joseph, what news do you hear? Though indeed, tis no matter, for I think one hears nothing else but scandal. Exactly so, Mrs. Candor. Ah! Child, well, is the courtship over between you and Charles? His extravagance, I presume. The town talks of nothing else. I am sorry, madam, that the town is not better employed. As am I, of course, but there's no stopping people's tongues. I own I was hurt to hear it, as indeed I was to learn that your guardian, Sir Peter, and Lady Teasel have not agreed lately so well as could be wished. Such reports are scandalous. Aye, so they are. Shameful, shameful. But the world is so censorious, no character escapes. Lord, now who would have suspected your friend, Miss Prim, of an indiscretion? Yet such is the ill nature of people that they say her uncle stopped her last week, just as she was stepping into a carriage with her dancing master. I'll answer for it. There are no grounds for that report. Oh, no foundation in the world, I dare swear. No more, probably, than for the story circulated last month of Mrs. Justino's affair with General Cornwallis. The license of invention some people take is monstrous indeed. Yes, but in my opinion, those who repeat such things are equally culpable. To be sure they are, child. Tail bearers are as bad as tail makers. I have always said so. But what's to be done? People will not be prevented from talking. Which reminds me, Joseph, the world is in a perfect chaos over the sins of your younger brother. I hope tis true that Charles is not absolutely ruined. I am afraid his circumstances are very bad indeed, madam. Uh, I heard so. But you must tell him to keep up his spirits. Everybody almost is in the same way. Lord Spindle, Sir Thomas Splint, Captain Quinns, and Mr. Nickett. All bankrupt I hear with him this week. So at least Charles is in very good company. Doubtless, madam, tis a great consolation to him. Mr. Crabtree and Sir Benjamin Backbite. So, Maria, you see your lover pursues you. Faith, where's the door? Is there a back way out? For shame. No young lady should be so arrogant as to run from a gentleman's flattery. Positively, you shan't escape. Lady Sneerwell, I kiss your hand. Mrs. Candor, I'm sure you remember my nephew, Sir Benjamin Backbite. But of course, your servant, Sir Benjamin. Egad, madam, he has a pretty wit, and is a pretty poet, too, isn't he, Lady Snarewell? Oh, fie, uncle, you flatter me too much. Why, egad, it's true. I back him at a sonnet or charade against the best rhymer in the kingdom. Yet I wonder, Sir Benjamin, you never publish anything. To say truth, ma'am, tis very vulgar to print. Only beggars publish, poor as they are, in either wit or money or both. You see how ingenious he is. Besides, as my scribblings are mostly satires and lampoons on particular people, I find they circulate more by giving private copies to the friends of the parties. However, I have some love elegies, which for this lady I may hazard to recite. By heaven, 
Madame Mariah Vale immortalize you. You will be handed down to posterity like Petrarch's Laura. I shouldn't mind playing Laura to Sir Benjamin's Petrarch if he promises to love me as the Italian poet did his mistress that is silently and from a great distance. A uh, hit, a palpable hit. Now, for God, madam, I love a woman who thinks she can be witty. Not as much as I love a man who can admit when he is not. Oh, but, ladies, have you heard the news? Miss Nicely is going to be married to her own footman. <laughs> uh, Tis true, asks Sir Benjamin. Yes, indeed, ma'am. Everything is fixed and the wedding liveries bespoke. Yes, and they say there were pressing reasons for it. <laughs> I have heard something of this before. It can't be. How was one to believe a story of so prudent a lady as Miss Nicely? Oh, Lord, ma'am, that is the very reason to us believed at once. She has always been so cautious and reserved that everybody was sure she was hiding a great sin. I am so Speaking of prudence, my dear Mr. Joseph Prey, is it true your uncle, Sir Oliver Service, is coming to town? I believe so, madam. Odd so. He has been in the East Indies so long, I'm sure you can scarce remember him. Sad comfort whenever he returns to hear how your brother has got on. Charles has been indiscreet, Mr. Crabtree, to be sure, but I hope no busy people have already prejudiced Sir Oliver against him. My brother may reform. To be sure, he may. For my part, I never believed him to be so utterly void of principle as people say. And though he has lost all his friends, I am told nobody is better spoken of by the Jews. Oh, that's true, Egad, nephew. I hear that Charles has borrowed from them enough to be in debt for 50 lifetimes. So, whenever he is sick, they have prayers for his recovery in the synagogue. <laughs> Yet no man lives in greater splendor. He will treat himself to feasts and pleasures which the king's own exchequer could never afford, at least of all during this tawdry war with the colonies. Lady Smearwell, I must wish you a good morning. I'm not very well. Oh dear, she changes color very much. Twas nothing but that Mariah could not bear to hear Charles reflected on. The young lady's penchant is obvious. But, Benjamin, you mustn't give up the pursuit for that. Follow her and put her into good humor. Repeat her some of your verses. Uh, maybe later. Uh, we mean no offense to your family, of course, Mr. Joseph, but depend upon it, your brother is utterly undone. His coffers, I hear, are so low that he has sold everything that was movable. I have seen one that visited his house. Not a thing left but some empty bottles that were overlooked and the family portraits, which nobody could have use for. And I'm very sorry also to hear some bad stories against him. Oh, he has done many bad things, that's certain, and with many women. But, however, as he's your brother... We'll give place that you may mourn his debauchery in private. <laughs> It is very hard for that trio to leave a subject they have not quite exhausted. I believe their abuse of Charles displeased your ladyship as much as Maria. Perhaps so, but it surprised me less. I fear the girl's affections are further engaged than we thought. But she is invited again this evening with Sir Peter and later Teasel, so we shall have an opportunity of observing her more closely. And plotting our mischief accordingly. Just so, Lady Snearwell. Just so. When an old bachelor takes a young wife, what is he to expect? Tis now six months since Lady Teasel made me the happiest of men, and ever since I have been the most miserable dog that ever committed wedlock. We tiffed a little, going into the church, and came to a quarrel before the bells had done ringing. I was more than once nearly choked with gall during the honeymoon, and had lost all comfort in life before my friends had done wishing me joy. Yet... I chose with caution, a girl bred wholly in the country who never knew luxury beyond one silk gown, but who now plays the part of the town lady as though she had been bred in Grosvenor Square. She dissipates my fortune and contradicts all my humors, yet the worst of it is that I'm sure I love her, else I should never bear such abuse. Oh, a pox of matrimony. It is the worst physic for loneliness mankind ever conceived. Sir Peter, your servant. Uh, How is it with you, sir? Oh, very bad, Mr. Rowley, very bad. I meet with nothing but crosses and vexations. What can have happened to trouble you since yesterday? A good question to ask a married man. 
Nay, I'm sure your wife can't be the cause of your uneasiness. Why, has anybody told you she was dead? Come, come, Sir Peter, you love her, though your tempers do not exactly agree. But the fault is entirely hers, Master Rowley. No, I, myself, am the sweetest tempered man alive, so I tell her a hundred times a day. Indeed. Aye, aye. And what is very extraordinary in all our disputes, she is always in the wrong. But but Lady Sneerwell and the other scandal mongers will encourage this perverseness of her disposition. Oh, then, to complete my aggravations, Mariah, my ward over whom I ought to have the power of a father, is determined to turn rebel too. She absolutely refuses Joseph Surface, the man that I have long resolved for her husband. And she dotes instead upon his profligate brother Charles. You know, Sir Peter, I have always taken the liberty to differ with you on the subject of these two young gentlemen. We shall not seek a quarrel over the dubious merits of the elder, but for Charles, my life on it, he will amend his errors yet. Their worthy father, my old master, was at Charles's ears nearly as wild a spark. You are wrong, Master Rowley. On their father's death, you know, I acted as a kind of a guardian to them both till their uncle, Sir Oliver's Eastern bounty gave them an early independence. No, no person could have a better opportunity to judge of their hearts. And I have never been mistaken in my life. Joseph, oh yes, Joseph is indeed a man of sentiment and virtue. But for Charles, oh, on my life, if he had any grain of virtue by descent, it is long since dissipated with the rest of his inheritance. I am sorry to find you so violent against the young man, because this may be the most critical period of his fortune. I came hither with news that will surprise you. What? <laughs> Let me hear. Sir Oliver Surface is just arrived from overseas and stays in town. Ha, 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 you astonish me. I, I thought you did not expect him this month. I did not, but his passage has been remarkably quick. Oh, egad, I shall rejoice to see my old friend. And, oh, but does he still command us not to inform his nephews of his arrival? Most strictly. He means, before he makes his presence known, to make some trial of their dispositions. And we have already planned something for the purpose. Well, a wasted effort, if you ask me, but Sir Oliver shall have his way. And pray, does he know that I'm married? Yes, and will soon wish you joy. Oh, nay, I fear he shall laugh at me, for we used to rail against wedlock together. I pray thee, Mr. Rowley, don't drop a word that Lady Teasel and I ever disagree. By no means. <clears throat> But then you must be very careful not to differ while Sir Oliver is in the house with you. Egad, and that's impossible. Oh, Mr. Rowley, when an old bachelor marries a young wife, he deserves... Well, no. No, the crime carries the punishment along with it. <laughs> Lady Teasel, Lady Teasel, I'll not bear it. Sir Peter, Sir Peter, you may scold or smile according to your humor, but I ought to have my own way in everything. And what's more, I will, too. For though I was educated in the country, I know very well that women of fashion in London are accountable to nobody after they are married. Well, and so a husband is to have no influence, no authority? <laughs> Authority? No, to be sure. If you wanted authority over me, you should have adopted me and not married me. I'm sure you are old enough. Old enough? I, I, there it is. Well, well, Lady Teasel, though my life may be made unhappy by your temper, I'll not be ruined by your extravagance. My extravagance? I'm sure I'm no more extravagant than a wife ought to be. No, no, madam, you shall throw away no more sums on such unmeaning, unmeaning luxury. Slife, you, you have spent as much furnishing your dressing room with flowers in winter as would purchase a second British Navy. Oh, Lord, Sir Peter, am I to blame because flowers are expensive in cold weather? You should find fault with the climate, not with me. Of ingratitude. You forget, madam, what your situation was when I married you. But I don't. It was a very disagreeable one, or I should never have agreed to it. Yes, madam, you were then in somewhat a humbler style, the daughter of a plain country squire, trapped in a rickety old manor, surrounded by an army of goats. Oh, horrible! Horrible! Don't put me in mind of it! Yes, madam, this was the dreary life I rescued you from, but now, now there's no one more outrageously in the fashion. You have adopted every style 
style every foppery. And you should thank me for it. Would you have your wife be out of the fashion? Egad, I should think you would like to have your lady thought a woman of taste. Taste? Zones, madam, you had no taste when you married me. I wholeheartedly agree. Marrying you was the most tasteless thing I ever did. Then why did you do it? Shall I tell you the truth? If it's not too great a favor. Why, the fact is I was tired of my dreary pastoral existence, and so, furnished with youth and beauty, I determined to marry the first rich man that would have me. Well, this is plain dealing indeed. But now, Sir Peter, if we have finished our daily jangle, I presume I may go to my engagement at Lady Snearwell's? Oh, I, another sticking point. A charming set of acquaintance you have made there. Nay, Sir Peter, they are elegant people and of remarkably tenacious reputations. Well, of course they are, madam, but they don't choose anybody should have a good character but themselves. Oh, such a crew. All of them. All utterers of forged tales, coiners of scandal, and clippers of reputation. What, would you restrain the freedom of speech? Yes! And they have made you just in their image, a scandalmonger to the core. I believe I do play my part with a tolerable grace, but I vow I bear no malice against the people I abuse, and I take it for granted they deal exactly in the same manner with me. But, Sir Peter, you promised to come to Lady Snarewell's too. Oh, well, well, I, I, I'll call in just to look after my own character. You must make haste after me, or it will be too late. So goodbye to you. Well, I have... Gained nothing by this argument. Yet with what a charming air she contradicts everything I say. Well, though I can't make my wife love me, there is certainly a great satisfaction in quarreling with her. And I think she never appears to such advantage as when she is doing everything in her power to plague me. Positively, we will hear it. Yes, yes, the epigram, by all means. Oh, plague on it, Uncle, tis mere nonsense. Oh, no, for God, tis very clever for an extempore. Uh, but, ladies, you should first be acquainted with the circumstances. You must know that one day last week, as Lady Betty Curicle was taking the dust in High Park in a sort of a duodecimo phaeton, she desired me to write some verses on her ponies, upon which I took out my pocketbook and, in a moment, produced the following. <coughs> sure never were two such beautiful ponies other horses are clowns and these macaronis nay to give them this title i'm sure isn't wrong their legs are so slim and their tails are so long <laughs> Oh, there, ladies, done in the smack of a whip, and on horseback, too. A very Phoebus mounted indeed, Sir Benjamin. Oh, dear sir, trifles, trifles. I simply must have a copy. Lady Teasel, I hope we shall see Sir Peter. I believe he'll wait on your ladyship presently. Maria, my love, you look grave. Come, sit down to bouquet with Mr. Joseph. I take very little pleasure in cards. However, I'll do as you please. Now I'll die, but you are so scandal I'll forswear your society. What's the matter, Mrs. Candor? They'll not allow our friend, Miss Vermilion, to be handsome. Oh, surely, she's a pretty woman. I'm very glad you think so, madam. She has a charming, fresh color. Yes, when it is fresh, put on. <laughs> Why, I'll swear her color is natural. I've seen it come and go. I dare swear you have, madam. It goes of a night and comes again in the morning. <laughs> How you talk so? But pray, what think you of Miss Simper? Why, she has very pretty teeth. Oh, yes, and would have the world know it. For when she is neither speaking nor laughing, which very seldom happens, she never absolutely shuts her mouth, but leaves it always ajar. <laughs> can you be so ill-natured? Wait, hey, but surely that's better than the pains Miss Prim takes to conceal her losses in front. She draws her mouth till it resembles a locked church door and all the words slide out edgewise. <laughs> very well, lady. Teasel, I see you can be a little severe. Pray, what is severity, my dear Lady Sneerwell, but subjectivity from a more beautiful source? <laughs> but here comes Sir Peter to spoil our mirth. Ladies, your obedient servant. Oh, mercy on me. Here is the whole set. The character's dead at every word, I suppose. I am rejoiced you are come, Sir Peter. They have been so censorious, and Lady Teasel as bad as anyone. Yes, well, this must be very distressing to you, Mrs. Candor. Oh, they will allow good qualities to nobody, not even good nature to our friend, Mrs. Percy. What, the fat dowager who was at Mrs. Quadrill's last night? 
Nay, come now, her bulk is her misfortune, and when she takes such pains to get rid of it, you ought not to jeer. Yes, I know. She lives entirely in water and hard grain. Tis sorrowful indeed. <laughs> I thank you, Lady Teasel, for defending her. Oh, yes, a good defense, truly. For my part, I own I cannot bear to hear a friend ill spoken of. Oh, no, to be sure. Or at least I will never actively join in ridiculing a friend, so I constantly tell my cousin Ogle, and you all know what pretensions she has to be critical in beauty. Oh, to be sure, she has herself the oddest countenance that was ever seen. Tis a collection of features from all different countries of the globe. <laughs> so she has indeed an Irish front. Caledonian locks. Dutch nose. Austrian lips. Complexion of a Spaniard. And teeth a la chinoise. <laughs> In short, her face resembles a congress at the close of a general war wherein all the members appear to have a different interest, and her nose and chin are the only parties likely to join issue. <laughs> <laughs> Mercy on my life, Sir Benjamin! Tis a person you dine with twice a week! Well said, Sir Peter, but you are a cruel creature, too phlegmatic yourself for a jest, and too peevish to allow wit in others. Indeed, my husband, Sir Peter, is such an enemy to scandal, I believe he would have, have it put down by Parliament. Though if I had such power, madam, there's many in London would thank me for the bill. Oh, Lord, Sir Peter, would you deprive us of our innocent recreation? Yes, madam, I would. No person should be permitted to kill characters or run down reputations, but qualified old maids and disappointed widows like you. Go to, you monster. Come, ladies, shall we sit down in cards in the next room? Sir Peter Teasel, a word in your ear. Ah, oh, ah, I'll be with them directly. Sir Peter, you are not leaving us. Oh, your ladyship must excuse me. I'm called away by particular business, but I leave my character behind me. Well, certainly, Lady Teasel, that husband of yours is a strange being. I could tell you some stories of him would make you laugh heartily. Oh, pray, let's hear him. In the next room, ladies. Lead the way, Sir Benjamin. Mariah, I see you have no satisfaction in this society. How is it possible I should? If to raise malicious smiles at the infirmities or misfortunes of those who have never injured us be the province of wit or humor, heaven grant me a double portion of dullness. But they appear more ill nature than they are. They have no malice at heart. Then is their conduct still more contemptible? At least, if malice had been in their natures from birth, they might be excused for not knowing to restrain it. But can you, Mariah, feel so passionately for others and be unkind to me alone? Hey, is hope to be denied its tenderest wish? Why will you distress me by renewing of this subject? Oh, Mariah, you would not treat me thus and oppose your guardian Sir Peter's wishes. Wouldn't I? Did I see you still lying for that wretch, that rival, mon frere? If I did love Charles, which you have no proof is the case, do you really imagine I would cease to love him when his distresses have sunk him so low as to deprive him of the regard even of his own brother? Nay, but Mariah, do not leave me with frown. By all that's honest, you must hear me first. You must protect yourself. For though I have the greatest regard for Lady Teasel, you know the story is full ripe that she and your precious Charles- No! No, I won't hear this, I won't. And, and Joseph, let me go! What's all this, pray? Uh, Lady Teasel. Ah, the one and only, sir. Mariah, my dear, you are wanted in the next room. Oh, thank God. Prithee, what did I stumble upon? Oh, the most unlucky circumstance in nature. Mariah has somehow suspected our affair and threatened to acquaint Sir Peter with her suspicions. And I was just endeavoring to reason with her when you came. Oh, but you seem to adopt a very tender mode of reasoning. Do you typically argue on your knees? Well, you know, she's a child, and I thought a little bombast. But, Lady Teasel, what are you to grant me that sweet liberty you promised? No, no, I begin to think it would be imprudent. And you know I admit you as a lover no farther than fashion requires. True, a mere platonic marionette, which every London wife is entitled to. Well... I applaud your moderation. <laughs> Go to, you are an insinuating hypocrite. And indeed, we shall be missed. Let us rejoin the company. True, but we must not return together. Very well, then. I shall leave you to your mischief and of thoughts of me. 
<laughs> a curious dilemma my politics have run me into. I wanted at first only to ingratiate myself with Lady Teasel that she might support me in my pursuit of Mariah. But I have, I don't know how, become her serious lover so that I stand a chance of committing a crime I never meditated and probably of losing Mariah in the process. Sincerely, I begin to wish I'd never made such a point of convincing the world I have a good character, for it has led me into so many cursed rogueries that I'm sure I shall be exposed at last. <laughs> and so my old friend is married, eh? A young wife out of the country. <laughs> That he should have played the old bachelor so long and yet sink into a husband at last. You must not rally him on the subject, Sir Oliver. Tis a tender point, I assure you. Though he has been married only seven months. Oh, then he has been just half a year on the stool of repentance. Poor Peter. But uh, you say he has entirely given up my nephew Charles? Never sees him, huh? His prejudice against the boy is astonishing, and no doubt exacerbated by jealousy over the alleged affair between Charles and Lady Teasel, which Sir Peter has been led to believe by a scandalous society here in town. Whereas the truth, I think, is that if the lady is partial to either of the brothers, tis Joseph the Elder. Ah, I know there are a set of malicious gossips, both male and female, who murder characters to kill time, but I shall not be prejudiced against my nephew by such, Mr. Rowley. I assure you. No, no. If Charles has done nothing false or mean, I shall pay off his debts and forgive his extravagance. Then my life on it, you will reclaim him. Ah, sir, it does me good to know that the son of my good old master surface has yet one friend. But hark, here comes Sir Peter Teasel. Oh, gad, so he does. Oh, mercy on me, he looks like a husband. Somber all over. Ho, 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 Sir Oliver, my old friend. Oh, welcome to England a thousand times. Oh. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Peter. I am as glad to find you so well, believe me. Oh, by our lady, tis a long time since we met. Seven years, I think, and I find you have not been idle, for you are freshly married. <laughs> well, well, it can't be helped, and so I wish you joy with all my heart. Oh, thank you, Sir Oliver. Yes, I have entered the happy state, <laughs> but we'll not talk of that now. Oh. Uh, true, Sir Peter. Old friends shouldn't talk of grievances at first meeting. No, no. Hi, Sir Oliver. I warned you not to tease him. Well, so, uh, one of my nephews, I find, is a wild rogue, huh? Wild, oh, my old friend, I grieve for your disappointment there. No, Charles is a lost young man indeed. Now, however, his elder brother will make you amends. Joseph is exactly what a young man should be. Everybody in the world speaks well of him. Oh, I'm sorry to hear it. If everybody speaks well of him, then he is bowed as low to knaves and fools as to the honest dignity of virtue. What, Sir Oliver, do you blame Joseph for not making enemies? Yes, if he has merit enough to deserve them. Well, well, you'll be convinced when you know him, for Joseph professes the noblest sentiments. Not a plague on his sentiments. If he salutes me with a scrap sentence of morality in his mouth, I shall be sick directly. But, 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 but don't, however, mistake me, Sir Peter. I don't mean to defend Charles's errors. Rather, before I form my judgment of either of the boys, I intend to make a trial of their hearts. And my friend Rowley and I have planned something for the purpose. And Sir Peter shall own he has been, for once, mistaken. <laughs> oh, nay, my life on Joseph's honour. Well, come, give us a bottle of good wine, we'll drink the lad's health, and tell you our scheme. Well, allons-y, then. <laughs> Mm. Ah, now, pray, uh, explain it further, Master Rowley. I, I don't see the jet of your scheme. Why, Sir Peter, this Mr. Stanley, whom I was speaking of, is closely related to the Surface Brothers by their mother. He was once a merchant in Dublin, but has since been ruined by a series of shipwrecks, uh, shipwrecks that cost him a great many of his goods on the high seas. 
Now you see, lately come to England to solicit the assistance of his friends here, poor Mr. Stanley has been flung into prison by some of his creditors, where he now loiters in rank captivity. Aye, and tis a worthy fellow too, I, I remember him, but what is this to lead to? You shall hear. Mr. Stanley has applied by letter both to Mr. Joseph and Mr. Charles for assistance. From the former, he has received nothing but evasive promises of future service, while Charles has given him what little money he had remaining in his coffers, and is at this time endeavoring to raise a sum, part of which he intends shall post bail for poor Stanley. Oh, he is my brother's son. Well, but how is Sir Oliver personally- Why, sir, I will inform Charles and Joseph that Stanley has obtained permission in person to apply to his friends, and as neither of them have ever seen him, let Sir Oliver assume his character, and thus he will have a fair opportunity of judging of the benevolence of their dispositions. Well, this will prove nothing. I, I make no doubt that Charles is a coxcomb and thoughtless enough to give money to poor relations if he have it. I certainly hope to find him such a fool. I have brought a few rupees home with me, Sir Peter, and I only want to be sure of bestowing them rightly. Well, well, make the trial if you please. Uh, but uh, where is this fellow whom you brought for Sir Oliver to examine? The money lender engaged by Charles? Below, awaiting his commands. And no one can give better intelligence. This Sir Oliver is a friendly Jew who, to do Charles justice, has done everything in his power to bring your nephew to a proper sense of his extravagance. Pray, let's have him in. Desire Mr. Moses to walk upstairs. Now, additionally, gentlemen, you must know that in our trial of the Surface Brothers, I have another evidence in my power. One Mr. Snake, whom I shall shortly produce to remove some of your prejudices, Sir Peter, relating to Charles and Lady Teasel. Oh, I have heard too much on that subject. Here comes the honest Israelite, Mr. Moses, sir. <laughs> this is Sir Oliver. Uh, well, sir, I understand you have lately had great dealings with my nephew Charles. Yes, Sir Oliver, I have done all I could for him, but alas, he was ruined before he came to me for assistance. No, oh, unfortunate indeed, but I suppose you have done all in your power for him, honest Moses? Yes, indeed, sir. This very evening I was to have brought him a gentleman from the city who does not know him and will, I believe, advance some money. Oh, do you mean a man in London Charles has never had money from before? Yes, a, a Mr. Premium of Crutchet Friars. E. Gad, sir, Oliver, a thought strikes me. No, you say, Mr. Moses, that uh, Charles does not know Mr. Premium. Not at all. Oh, now then, Sir Oliver, try a new plot. Go with my friend Moses and represent Mr. Premium, and then I dare swear you shall see your nephew in all his degradation. Gad, I like this idea better than the other. Uh, and then I may visit Joseph afterwards as old Mr. Stanley. Uh, true, so you may. Can we trust you, Mr. Moses, to keep up our charade? You may depend upon me, Mr. Rowley, and tis near the time I was to have gone. Uh, I'll accompany you as soon as you please, Moses. Uh, but hold on, I, I, I forgot one thing. <laughs> How the plague shall I be able to pass for a Jew? There's no need, sir. The principal is Christian. But aren't I rather too smartly dressed to look like a moneylender? I beg your pardon. No, 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 sir, Oliver. It would not be out of character if you went in your own carriage, for a Jew may have some fine things. Don't you agree, Moses? I hardly know, sir, but I do know that any man with two legs may ride in a carriage. Yeah. Uh, well, but, but how must I talk, Moses? There, there's certainly some lingo of usury and mode of treating uh, that, that I ought to know. On a nearer view, gentlemen, perhaps I cannot be of assistance after all. No, 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 Mr. Moses, none of that. Pray, no, my friend Oliver is but a consummate actor who would play his part well. No, he means no disrespect, I am sure. Uh, uh, faith, none at all. Faith, Sir Oliver, is a word I had rather not hear you speak again. Uh, well, off to the Libertine's apartment then, for you know Charles Lodges hereby. My Jewish tutor and I humbly take our leave. God grant me Christian patience. <sighs> so there's one scheme underway and nay, 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 you shan't follow them, Rowley. You are biased in favor of the boy and would prepare Charles for the plot. 
No, upon my word, Sir Peter. No, I... no, come, come, come. Bring me this snake creature that you mentioned, and I'll hear what he has to say about Charles and my wife. And oh, 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 I see Mariah. I want to speak with her. Go, 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 go. <clears throat> so, child, has Mr. Joseph returned with you? No, sir. He was engaged. Well, Mariah, do you not reflect, the more you converse with that amiable young man, what recompense his love for you deserves? Indeed, Sir Peter, your frequent importunity on the subject distresses me. But if you'd have me be honest, I must confess that there is no man who has ever paid me an unwelcome attention whom I would not prefer to Joseph Surface. Oh, well, here's perverseness indeed. No, no, thou lying minx. Tis only Charles whom you would prefer. Tis evident his vices and follies have won your heart. This is unkind, sir. You know I have obeyed your orders and neither seeing nor corresponding with Charles these 16 days. I have heard enough to convince me that he is unworthy of my regard for reasons touching my lady Teasel. And yet I will not flagellate myself for a natural compassion that obliges me to pity him, though my conscience and your instructions dictate I must refuse his love. Well, pity Charles as much as you please, but give your heart and hand to a worthier object. Never to his brother. Yo, go to, you perverse and headstrong. Oh, but take care, madam. You have never yet known what the authority of a guardian is. Do not compel me to inform you of it. And you, Sir Peter, have never yet known what the obstinacy of an heiress can be. Tis true, by my father's will, I am briefly bound to regard you as his substitute, but I must cease to think you so when you would compel me to be miserable. Oh! Uh I am not your daughter by birth, but only by circumstance, which is why it costs me not one shred of self-respect to say I flout your authority, I spurn your protection, and I find you as perfect a bully as you are a cuckold. Good day, sir. Was ever a man so crossed as I am? Everything conspiring to fret me and you. Oh, and for further proof, here comes my eternal vexation, my wife. Lord, Sir Peter, I hope you haven't been quarreling with Mariah. Tis unkind to me that you should be ill-humored when I am not by. <laughs> oh, Lady Teasel, you might have the power to make me good-humored at all times. I'm sure I wish I had, for I want you to be in a charming sweet temper at this moment. Do be good-humored now, husband, and let me have two hundred pounds, will you? Two hundred pounds? What, can I not be in a good humor without paying for it? <laughs> but if they, uh, there's nothing I could refuse you, no, here, you shall have it, my dear, but seal me a bond for repayment. Oh, no, there, my handshake will do as well. I take it with all my heart. And pray, if we must persist on opposing sides, let our future contest be who shall be most obliging. Hmm? Content. <laughs> No, upon my word, husband, good nature becomes you. You look as you did before we were married, when you used to walk with me under the elms and tell me stories of what a gallant you were in your youth and ask me if I thought I could love an old fellow who would deny me nothing, didn't you? Yes, yes. And you were as kind and attentive. Aye, so I was. I would always take your part. Like when my cousin Sophie would abuse you and turn oh. you to ridicule, I defended you most valiantly and said, <laughs> I didn't think you so old and ugly and that I was sure you'd make a very good sort of a husband. You prophesied right. And we shall certainly now be the happiest couple. Never differ again. No, never. <laughs> Though at the same time, my dear Lady Teasel, you must watch your temper very narrowly, for in all our little quarrels, my dear, if you recollect, you always begin first. I beg your pardon, my dear Sir Peter, you always gave the provocation. Now see, my love, take care. Contradicting isn't the way to keep friends. Then don't you begin it, my love. There, <laughs> no, you want to quarrel again. No, I'm sure I don't, but if you will be so peevish. Oh, there, now, now who begins first? When you, to be sure, I said nothing, but there's no bearing your temper. No, no, my dear, the fault's in your own temper. Ah, you are just what my cousin Sophie said you would be. Oh, now may all the plagues of marriage be doubled on me if I ever tried to be friends with you again. So much the better. 
Oh, good God, I was a madman to marry you. And I'm sure I was a fool to marry you, an old dangling bachelor who was single at 50 because he could never meet with anyone who would endure him. Oh, I have done with you, madam. You are an unfeeling, ungrateful, un... Oh, what? Is the madman run out of insults? I believe you capable of doing anything that's bad. Oh, like what? Like the reports that you and that bastard, that you and that Charles are... Take care, Sir Peter. You had better not insinuate any such thing. I'll not be suspected without cause, I promise you. Very well, madam. Very well. A separate maintenance as soon as you please. Yes, madam. Or a divorce. I'll make an example of myself for the benefit of all middle-aged bachelors. Let us separate, madam. Agreed. And now, my dear Sir Peter, we are of a mind once more and may be the happiest couple and never differ again. Ha, ha, ha. Well, you are going to be in a violent passion, I see, and I shall only interrupt you. So, bye bye And for a postscript, I abhor you! Plagues and tortures! She affects an easiness that's unbearable! Oh, oh, oh. I am the most miserable fellow, but I'll not bear her presuming to keep her temper. No, she may break my heart, but she shan't keep her temper! Hey! For heaven, tis true. There is the great degeneracy of the age. Many of our acquaintance have, have taste, spirit, and politeness, but a plague on it, they won't drink. True words, Charles. They give to all the substantial luxuries of the table and abstain from nothing but wine and wit. W what are they to do who love play better than wine? Either win or lose in cold sobriety, which makes them equally unendurable. For my party, Gad, I am never so successful as when I'm a little merry. Let me down a bottle of champagne and I never lose. Or at least I never feel my losses, which is exactly the same thing. Ah, uh, that may be, but it is as impossible to follow wine and play as to unite love and politics. Fie, you may do both. Caesar made love and laws in a breath and was liked by the Senate as well as the ladies. But no man can pretend to be a believer in love who is an abjurer of wine. Alcohol is the test by which a lover knows his own heart. Fill a dozen bumpers to a dozen beauties, and she that floats atop is the maid that has bewitched you. Now then, Charles, be honest and give us yours. Pray do, Charles, give us her name. Tell us in faith. Oh, hey, sirs, I have withheld her only compassion to you. If I toast her, you must give a round to her peers, which is impossible. Oh, why so, Charles? Because the lady is peerless, sir, and no woman breathing can equate. Oh, we'll find some canonized vestals or heathen goddesses. That'll do. I warrant. Oh, content. Here, then, bumpers, you rogues, bumpers, to Mariah. Mar Mariah. To Mariah. Mariah of who? Again, the surname. Tis too formal to be registered in love's calendar. What's this? Oh, love, sayest so thou. I thought you were toasting your mistress. Well, I was. Am. Charles, service, have you broken the cardinal rule of bachelorhood? Which cardinal rule? There are so many. I mean the inviolable maxim that a gentleman must never fall in love with a whore. <laughs> I confess I often wish that she were so, if my dear Mariah had not the virtue of a martyr and the fortune of an empress, it might be easier to reconcile myself to the impossibility of a union betwixt us. Your happiness, sir, is all my stake in the story, and yet it is strange to hear Charles Surface speak so longingly of marriage. Eh, not half so strange as it is for Charles Surface himself to long for it, I assure you. Mr. Charles, sir. Oh, shit. Gentlemen, uh, you must excuse me a little careless. Take the chair, will you? Nay, prithee, Charles, do not throw us out. What, has your peerless Mariah dropped in by chance? No, Faith, to tell you the truth, tis a Jewish gentleman and a broker who are come by appointment. Oh, damn it, let's have the Jew in! Aye, and the broker, too, by all means. Yes, yes, the Jew and the broker. Hey, God, that is the ring of a fine fable. 
Trip, bid the gentlemen walk in. I promise you, friends, these men shall not serve your merriment. And why not, pray? Are we not excellent company? Oh, there we are. Excellent company. Well, for one thing, ours has been preordained a meeting of business, so my guests will not be drinking. What, what drink? Congregate for business and, and not drink. Zacrilege. Nevertheless, tis our arrangement and you must be gone. Fine, Trip, are you still here? Bid them come up, I say. Mr. Moses and Mr. Premium? Is that truly his name? Yes, sir. Well, let's have a premium then. Beg on them then. If they won't drink, we'll not sit down with them. Come, friends, the dice are in the next room. Charles, you'll join us when you've finished your uh, sober business with the gentleman? I will. I will. Oh, oh, pox on this wine soaked breath. They'll arraign me for it, I'm sure. Oh, why was I born with the curse of being utterly unable to conquer the first impression? Yeah, here they are. So, honest Moses, walk in, walk in, pray, Mr. Premium. That's the gentleman's name, isn't it, Moses? Yes, sir. Here are chairs for you both. Sit down, gentlemen. Mr. Premium, you and I are but strangers yet, though I hope we shall be better acquainted by and by. Uh, indeed, Mr. Charles, uh, I hope we shall. More intimately, perhaps, than your wish. Uh, I, I see many empty bottles at your tables. Uh, I hope we've not uh, interrupted you in a moment of pleasure. Not at all. Uh, just as I hope you are not so unsteady now as to speak sensibly and to the point. <laughs> if you would have me speak sensibly, you should be glad I am drunk. <coughs> Sir, this is Mr. Premium, a gentleman of the strictest honor and secrecy who always performs what he undertakes. Mr. Premium, this and is... Mr. Chubby, have done. Sir, my friend Moses is a very honest fellow, but a little slow at expression. He'll be an hour giving us our titles, and my interests haven't the time for such ceremony. Mr. Premium, the plain state of the matter is this. I am an extravagant young fellow who wants to borrow money. You, I take to be a prudent old fellow who has got money to lend. Now, sir, you see we are acquainted at once and may proceed without further salutation. Hmm. Exceeding frank upon my word. Uh, I, I, I say, sir, you're not a man of many compliments. Mm, the world is full of compliments, Mr. Premium. Many of them false and nearly all of them calculated, and nowhere in my experience so fraudulent as here in London. Plain dealing in business, I always think best. Uh, sir, I like you the better for it. Uh, come then, let's deal plainly with one another. Were I to lend you the sum you desire, which uh, Mr. Moses has conveyed to me, what security could you give? You have no land, I suppose. Not a molehill nor a twig. Nor any stock, I presume. Nothing but livestock. <laughs> and, and that's only a few ponies. But pray, Mr. Premium, are you acquainted at all with any of my connections? Why, to say the truth, I am. Then you must know that I have a devilish rich uncle in the East Indies. Sir Oliver Surface, from whom I have the greatest expectations. I have heard as much, sir, but your expectations may be nothing more than wishful thinking. Oh, no, there can be no doubt. They tell me I'm a prodigious favorite and that my uncle talks of leaving me everything. Indeed. Oh, this is the first I've heard of it. Yes, yes, tis just so. Moses knows tis true, don't you, Moses? Oh, yes, I swear to it. Now, I propose, Mr. Premium, if it's agreeable to you, a post-obit on Sir Oliver's life that, when he dies, I shall render up from my inheritance the sum of your loan to me, plus interest. Though at the same time, the old fellow has been so generous to me that I should be very sorry to hear that anything had happened to him. Not more than I should, I assure you. <laughs> but uh, uh, the bond you mentioned happens to be just the worst security you could offer me. For I've heard Sir Oliver Surface is as high and healthy as any man of his years in Christendom. Alas, sir, you are misinformed. No, no, the climate has hurt him considerably, poor Uncle Oliver. Yes, indeed, he breaks a pace, I'm told, and is so much altered lately that his nearest relations would not know him. <laughs> <laughs> You're glad to hear that, Mr. Premium? 
No, 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 I'm not. Yes, yes, you are. You know that mends your chances. Uh, but I'm told Sir Oliver is coming back to town. Uh, some say he <laughs> he's already arrived. Sure, I must know better than you whether he's come or not. No, rely on it. He's at this moment at uh, Calcutta, isn't he, Moses? Oh, yes, certainly. Uh, but, sir, as I understand, you want a few hundred pounds immediately. Is there nothing you could dispose of? How do you mean? Uh, for instance, I've heard that your father left behind a great deal of silver plate. <gasps> oh, Lord, that's gone long ago. Oh, good luck, all the family race cup and corporation balls. Uh, then it was also supposed that, that his library was one of the most valuable and compact. Yes, yes, so it was. Too much so for a private gentleman. For my part, I always thought it a shame to keep so much knowledge to myself. Mercy upon me learning that it run in the family like an heirloom. Uh, so, so, uh, nothing left of the family property, uh, uh, I suppose. Not much indeed. Oh, unless you have a mind to the family pictures, I have got a room full of ancestors above. And if you have a taste for old paintings, he gad, you shall have them at a bargain. Eh? What the devil? So you, you wouldn't sell your forefathers, would you? Every man of them to the best bidder. What? Your great uncles and aunts? I and my great grandfathers and grandmothers, too. Oh, what the plague, Mr. Charles? Have you no bowels for your own kindred? Hey, my dear broker, don't be angry. What need you care if you have your money's worth? Oh, I'll never forgive him for this, never. Come, Charles, what keeps you? I can't come yet. In faith, we are going to have a sale above stairs. Here's Mr. Premium come to buy all of my ancestors. Burn all your ancestors. No. B but he may do that afterwards if he pleases. <laughs> Stay careless. We want you. Me? Yes, indeed, sir. You shall be our auctioneer. With all my heart. I can handle a hammer as well as a dice box. Come, Moses, you shall play the appraiser if we want one. God's my life. Mr. Premium, you don't seem to like this business. Uh, oh, yes, I, I, I do. <laughs> Yes, I, I, I think it's a rare joke to sell one's family by auction. Ah, 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 ah. Oh, the prodigal. <laughs> to be sure. When a man wants money, where the plague should he get assistance if not from his own relations? <laughs> <laughs> I'll never forgive him for this. Never. Never. Walk in, gentlemen, pray, walk in. Here they are, Mr. Premium, for your approval. The family of the surfaces up to the conquest. Uh, and in my opinion, a, a goodly collection. Aye, aye, these are all done in the true spirit of portrait painting, all stiff and awkward as the originals, and not one jot of happiness in any Lord's face. Uh, we shall never see such figures of men again. I hope not. Now, come. Get to your pulpit, Mr. Auctioneer. Here's an old gouty chair of my grandfather's will answer the purpose. But Charles, I have a hammer, and what's an auctioneer without his hammer? Hmm? Yeah, that's true. Uh, here, use this candlestick. It is solid iron, I think, and now you may knock down my ancestors with their own pedigree. <laughs> Come then, let's begin. <laughs> Bravo, careless. Well, Mr. Premium, here's my great uncle, Sir Richard Ravelin, a marvelous good general in his day, I assure you. He served in all the Duke of Marlborough's wars and wrote some very brave letters in the Battle of Malplaquet. What do you bid for this bedizened coward, this paragon of pomposity? Uh, Mr. Moses, bid him speak first. And Mr. Premium would have you speak first. Hmm. Why, then... He shall have him for 10 pounds, and I'm sure that's not dear for a staff officer. Heaven, heaven deliver me his famous Uncle Richard for 10 pounds. Uh, very well, Mr. Charles, I'll, I'll take him a bet. <laughs> Careless, knock down my Uncle Richard. Gladly, sir. Here now is a maiden sister of his, my great Aunt Deborah, done by Neller in his best manner, and esteemed a very formidable likeness. There she is, you see, the richest lady in London, costumed like a shepherdess, feeding her flock. You shall have her for five pounds ten. Those sheep are worth the money. 
Oh, poor Deborah. Uh, uh, very well, sir. Five pounds ten. She's mine. Knock down my Aunt Deborah. <laughs> Here now are two that were a sort of cousin of theirs. You see, Moses, these pictures were done some time ago when Bo wore wigs and the ladies their own hair. Yes, truly, headdresses appear to have been a little lower in those cavalier days. Well, Mr. Premium, take that couple for the same price. It is a good bargain. Uh, I am content, sir. Careless, knock down the fox. Oh, uh, and here's a jolly fellow. I don't know what relation, but he was the mayor of Norwich. Take him at eight pounds. Uh, no, 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 six will do for the mayor. For, <laughs> I dare say he rigged the election. And his corruption thereby renders him all the more interesting. Come, Mr. Premium, make it eight, and I'll throw you the two aldermen into the bargain. No, they're mine. Now, a plague on it, we shall be all day retailing in this manner. Do let us deal wholesale. What say, you little premium? Give me 300 pounds for the rest of the family in a lot. Aye, aye, that'll be the best way. Hmm. Well, uh, anything to accommodate you, Mr. Charles, they, they are mine, but... Uh, but... There is one portrait which you've always passed over. What, what that ill-looking little fellow over the fireplace? Yes, sir, though I don't think him so ill-looking a fellow by any means. You want that? Well, that's, that's my Uncle Oliver. It was painted before he went to India. Your Uncle Oliver? Gad, then you'll never be friends with him, Charles, for he looks to me as severe a rogue as ever I saw. An incorrigible knave, depend on it. But don't you think so, Mr. Premium? Uh, upon my soul, sir, I do not. I think it is as honest looking a face as any in the room, dead or alive. But uh, I, I suppose Uncle Oliver goes with the rest of the lumber. Hmm? I said, I suppose you will toss the picture of your Uncle Oliver into the lump. Of course you will. Won't you, Charles? No. No. No, hang it. I'll not part with poor Oliver. The old fellow has been very good to me, and again, I'll keep his picture while I have a room to put it in. Your pardon, Mr. Premium. Perhaps the rogue's my nephew after all. Oh, but, sir, uh, I've somehow taken a fancy to that picture. Then I am sorry, sir, for you shan't take it. Zoons, haven't you enough of them? I forgive him everything. Uh, Mr. Charles, when I have a whim, I follow it hard. Look here, I'll give you as much for that portrait as for all the rest. Oh, don't tease me, broker. I tell you, I'll not part with it, and there's an end. Well, well, I've, I, I've done. Uh, here, here's a draft for your sum. Why, tis for 800 pounds. It could have been 2,000. You'll not let Sir Oliver go. Zooms, no, I tell you once more. And never mind the difference, we'll balance that another time. But uh, give me your hand on the bargain. You are an honest fellow, Charles, and I appreciate your business. Uh, come, Moses. I follow you, sir. Good day, Mr. Premium. Well, this is the oddest genius of the sort I have ever met with. Gad, he's the prince of brokers, I think. Now, for heaven, I find one's ancestors are more valuable relations than I took them for. Hark, there's Roly coming towards us. Go, careless, and say I'll join the company in a few moments. I will, sir. Ha, <laughs> old Roly, Gad, you are just come in time to take leave of your old acquaintance. Yes, I heard the portraits were going, but I wonder you can have such spirits under so many distresses. <laughs> Boy, there's the point. My distresses are so many that I can't afford to part with my spirits. But I shall be rich and splenetic all in good time. There's no making you serious, is there, Master Charles? Yes, Faith, I am so now. Here, honest Rolly, here, redeem this promissory note directly and take a hundred pounds of it to old Mr. Stanley in prison. What? A hundred pounds? Consider, sir, the money might be better spent to pay your own debts. God's life, don't talk about it. Poor Stanley's needs are pressing. And so are yours, sir. I never will cease dunning you with the old proverb, be just. Be just before you are generous. Why, why, so I would if I could. But justice is an old hobbling mare, and I can't get her to keep pace with the stallion of generosity for the soul of me. 
Yeah, Charles, believe me, one hour's reflection might-, might cure me of my bankruptcy, yes, but it would seal Mr. Stanley's doom. And though I never met the man, he was my mother's own cousin, which surely entitles him to some measure of blind partiality. Roly, listen to me. While I have, by heaven, I'll give. So damn your economy. And now, if you'll excuse me, I must go lose a game of dice. <laughs> Upon my soul, the finest boy I ever saw. How Sir Oliver will be pleased to know at least one of his nephews possesses kindness and charity enough to be trusted in a king's ransom in East Indian gold. I'm sure Joseph will not prove so generous, whatever his sentiments, but time shall make all things clear. And so onward to the conclusion. No letter from Lady Teasel? No, sir. I hope she is not prevented from coming. Sir Peter certainly does not suspect me, yet I wish I may not lose the heiress through the scrape I have drawn myself in with the wife. However, Charles's imprudence and bad character are great points in my favor. Sir, that's the door. Go see who tis! I have a particular message for you if it should be my brother Charles. Tis her ladyship, sir. Ah, excellent. Bid her come in. I have a difficult hand to play in this affair. Lady Teasel has lately suspected my views on Mariah, but she must not be let into that secret, at least till I have her a little more in my power. What, sentiment and soliloquy? Have you been very impatient now? Oh, Lord, Joseph, don't pretend to look grave. I vow I couldn't come before. Nor should you, madam. Punctuality is a species of constancy, a very unfashionable quality in a lady. Upon my word, you want to pity me. Sir Peter is grown so ill-tempered to me of late, and so jealous. He's jealous of Charles, too. That's the best of the story, isn't it? I'm glad my scandalous friends keep that up. I'm sure I wish Sir Peter would let him marry Mariah, and then perhaps he would be convinced there's nothing between us. Don't you agree, Mr. Surface? Indeed, I do not. Oh, certainly I do. For then, my dear Lady Teasel would also be convinced that I have no designs on the silly girl. Oh, well, I'm inclined to believe you. Besides, I really could never perceive why Mariah should have so many admirers. Oh, for her fortune, nothing else. Nothing so, for although I suppose she is not riotously ugly, yet she has no desire to join in the pleasures of society and is so obstinate and moral that I declare I would think she'd have made an excellent wife for Sir Peter. So she would, madam. But you are very severe upon Mariah, if faith. Lady Sneerwell has quite corrupted you. No, indeed. I have not opinion enough of Sneerwell to be taught by her, and I know that she has lately raised many scandalous hints of me. Which is to say she treats you like all the others of her acquaintance. But isn't it provoking to hear the most ill-natured things said about one behind one's back? My friend, Lady Sneerwell, has circulated I don't know how many scandalous tales of me, and all without any foundation, too. That's what vexes me. I, madam, to be sure, that is the provoking circumstance. For when a slanderous story against one is believed, there certainly is no comfort like the consciousness of having deserved it. And then Sir Peter, too, to have him so peevish and so suspicious, when I know the integrity of my own heart, tis monstrous. But, my dear Lady Teasel, tis your own fault if you suffer it. Excuse me? When a husband entertains a groundless suspicion of his wife and withdraws his confidence in her, the original compact is broken, and she owes it to the honor of her sex to endeavor to outwit him. Indeed. You say if he suspects me without cause, it follows that the best way of curing his jealousy is to give him reason for it? Oh, undoubtedly, my dear Lady Teasel. If you but once were to make a trifling faux pas with a lover. You can't conceive how cautious you would grow and how ready to humor agree with your husband. Do you think so? I know it. And then you'd find all scandal would cease at once. For your character at present is like a person in a plethora, absolutely dying of too much help. So, so then I perceive your prescription as I must sin in my own defense and part with my virtue to preserve my reputation? Exactly so, 
upon my credit. Prudence, like experience, must be paid for. Faith, Mr. Joseph, I begin to think you are in the right. And I will fairly own to you that if I could be persuaded to do wrong, it would be by Sir Peter's ill usage. His barbarous ill usage. And your altogether more perfect and honorable logic. Then, by this hand which he is unworthy of. <laughs> Blockhead, what do you want? I beg your pardon, sir, but I thought you would choose for Sir Peter to come up without announcing him. Sir Peter? Zoom's the devil! My husband! Oh, Lord, I'm ruined! I'm ruined! Uh, sir, it wasn't I that let him in. Oh, I'm undone. What will become of me now, Mr. Surface? Oh, mercy. He's on the stairs. Oh, I'll get behind the screen and do not breathe a word that I am here. Oi, William, give me that book and get out. Go! Aha, ever improving himself. Good Mr. Surface. Oh, my dear Sir Peter, I beg your pardon. I've been dozing over a stupid book. Well, I am much obliged to you for this call. You haven't been here, I believe, since I've fitted up this room. Pray, what do you think of my decor? Oh, tis very neat indeed, very proper, and oh, and you even make use of your screen as a source of knowledge. Well, tis hung, I perceive, with maps of the world. Oh, yes, I find great use for that screen. Oh, I dare say you must when you want to find out anything in a hurry. <laughs> I don't hide anything in a hurry either. Well, I confess I am glad I find you alone, my dear Joseph, for I wish to unburden my mind to you on a point of the greatest importance to my peace. In short, my friend, Lady Teasel's conduct of late has made me very unhappy. Indeed, sir, I'm very sorry to hear it. Yes, tis plain she has not the least regard for me, but what's worse, I have pretty good authority to suspect that she must have formed an attachment to another. No! Yes! And between ourselves, I think I have discovered the person. How? You will learn me exceedingly. Ah, oh, my dear friend, I knew you would sympathize with me. Oh, yes, Sir Peter. Such a discovery would hurt me just as much as it would you. Oh, I am convinced of it. Oh, it is with great happiness to have a friend whom one can trust even with one's family secrets. But have you no guess who I mean? I haven't the most distant idea. It can't be Sir Benjamin Backbite. Oh, Lord, no. Oh, no, 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 no. What say you to Charles? Charles? My brother? Impossible. To be sure, Sir Peter, he has been charged with many things, but I can never think Charles would meditate so gross an injury. Ah, oh, my dear friend, the goodness of your own heart misleads you. You judge of others by yourself, but weigh him justly. We both know Charles has no sentiment. Oh, you never hear him talk so. Well, there certainly is no knowing what men are capable of. Well, there is no knowing. Yet I can't but think Lady Teasel herself has too much principle. Oh, I, but what's principle against the flattery of a handsome, lively young fellow? Well, that's very true. And then you know the difference of our ages makes it very improbable that she should have any great affection for me. True again. But ah, oh, that the nephew of my old friend, Sir Oliver, should be the person to attempt such an injury hurts me more nearly. Oh, undoubtedly, when ingratitude barbs the dart of injury, the wound has double danger in it. Well, I tell you, Sir Peter, if this affair with Lady Teasel should be proved on him, Charles is no longer any brother of mine. I will disclaim kindred with him, for the man who can break through the laws of hospitality and attempt the wife of his friend deserves to be branded as the, the pest of society. What a difference there is between you and he. What noble sentiments. But yet I cannot suspect Lady Teasel's honor. Well, I'm sure that I wish to think well of her and to remove all grounds of quarrel between us, for to say sooth, I confess I am more than a little in love with her. Now, as we seem to differ in our ideas of expense, I have resolved she shall be her own mistress in that respect for the future. And if I were to die, she shall find that I have not been inattentive to her, to her interests while living. Now, here, my friend, are the drafts of two deeds lately notarized. By one, she will enjoy 800 a year independent while I live, and by the other, the bulk of my fortune after my death. This conduct, Sir Peter, is indeed truly generous. 
I wish it may not sway her. Yes, I am determined that she shall have no cause to complain, though I would not yet have her acquainted with the latter instance of my affection for her. Nor I, if I could help it. Oh, and now, my dear friend, if you please, we will talk over the situation of your hopes with Mariah. No, no, Sir Peter, another time, if you please. No, I am sensibly chagrined at the little progress you seem to make in her affection. I beg you will not mention it. What are my disappointments when your happiness is in debate? Death, I shall be ruined every way! Um, uh, um... Sarah, what now? Your brother Charles, sir, is speaking to a gentleman in the street and says he knows you're within. Death, blockhead, I am not within. I am out for the day. No, stay, hold, an idea has struck me. Joseph, you shall be at home. William, William, go and tell him so. I shall, sir. Yes, now, I pray you to oblige me, my dear friend. Before Charles comes in, let me conceal myself somewhere. Then do you tax him on the matter we're talking on, and his answers may satisfy me at once. Oh, fie, Sir Peter. Would you have me join in so mean a trick to deceive my brother, too? Nay, you tell me that you are sure he is innocent. If so, you do him the greatest service in giving him an opportunity to clear his name. But... Uh... And what is more, it will set my heart at rest. Now, come, you shall not refuse me. No, no, here, here, behind this screen will do. And <laughs> oh, hey, uh -huh. hey, 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 what the devil? Well, there seems to be one listener here already. I'll swear I saw a petticoat. <laughs> uh, well, this is ridiculous enough. Um, I'll tell you. Sir Peter, uh, scorn to admit it. Parky, <laughs> tis a little French milliner, a silly little rogue that pleases me, and having some concern for her virtue, and upon your coming, she ran behind the screen. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I always took you for a charmer indeed. Well, very well. If your milliner claims a scream, well, well here's a closet. We'll do as well. Yes, go in there. <laughs> sly rogue. You sly rogue. <laughs> God's my life. What an escape in a curious situation I'm in to part man and wife in this manner. Oh, 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 sweet Joseph, couldn't I just steal off? No, no. Keep close, sorry, gentlemen. Good Joseph, now tax him home. Back, back into the closet, my dear friend. Oh, for God, I wish I had a key to that door. Hala, brother, what's the matter? You fellow wouldn't let me up at first. You haven't been winching, have you? No, brother, I leave such scandalous pursuits to you. But what has made Sir Peter Teasel steal off? I thought he had been with you. He was, brother, but hearing you were coming, he didn't choose to stay. What, was the old gentleman afraid I wanted to borrow money off him? No, sir, but I am sorry to find, Charles, you have lately given that worthy man grounds for great uneasiness. Yes, they tell me I do that to a great many worthy men. But how so, pray? To be plain with you, brother, he thinks you are endeavoring to gain Lady Teasel's affections from him. Do I? Oh, Lord, not I, upon my word. Ha! <laughs> so, the old fellow has finally figured out that he has a young wife, has he? Ooh, or what's worse, she has discovered that she has an old husband. Ooh. This is no subject to jest on, brother. He who can laugh... No, no, no axioms, Joseph. It's too early in the day. But seriously, I never had the least idea of what you charged me with, upon my honor. Well, it will give Sir Peter great satisfaction to hear this. Nay, and to speak plain, you surprised me exceedingly by naming me with Lady Teasel, for a faith I always understood you were her favorite. Oh, for shame, Charles. This retort is foolish. Egad, but I'm serious. Don't you remember one day when I called here? Nay, prithee, Charles. And, and found you together. Soon, sir, I insist. And another time, when your servant... Brother, brother, enough of this. God, I must stop him. Yes. Yes, your servant informed me that you- Hush! Not another word, I beseech you. You must know, brother, that Sir Peter has overheard all we have been saying. Huh? Sir Peter, where is he? Suddenly, 
there in the closet. For heaven, let's have him out. Sir Peter, come forth. Oh no. <laughs> I say, Sir Peter, come into court. Sir Peter. Why, my old guardian? What, turn inquisitor and take evidence incognito? Give me your hand, Charles. I believe I have suspected you wrongfully, but you must be angry with Joseph. Twas my plan. Oh, you don't say. Oh, but I acquit you of all charges, and I don't think you near so ill of you as I did. What I have heard has given me great satisfaction. Egad, then twas lucky you didn't hear any more. Wasn't it, brother? Oh, <laughs> would they were both out of the room. Your pardon, sirs. I have a private message for Mr. Joseph. Now in future, Mr. Charles, perhaps we may not be such strangers, eh? Gentlemen, I must beg pardon. I must wait on you downstairs. Here is a man come on particular business. Well, you can see him in another room. Sir Peter and I haven't met in a long time and I have something to say to him. They must not be left together. Egad, brother, I'll send this interloper away in a blink and return directly. Uh, Charles, if you associated more with your brother, one might indeed hope for your reformation. He is a man of sentiment, and there is nothing in the world so noble as a man of sentiment. He is too moral by half, and so apprehensive of his good name, as he calls it, that I suppose he would as soon let a priest in his house as a girl. No, 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 come, 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 you wrong him. No, no, Joseph is no rake, but he is no such saint in that respect either. He, yeah. Now I think on it. <laughs> have you a mind to have a good laugh against him? Hmm? I should like it best of all things. Oh, then in faith, we will. Now, harky. He had a girl with him when I called. Joseph, you jazz. Yes, 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 a little French milliner. And the best part is she's in the room now. The devil she is. I hide behind the screen. <laughs> well, come then, let's unveil her. No, 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 no. Oh, no, he's coming back. No, you shan't indeed. No, and Gad will have a peep at the little milliner. No, no, not for the world. No, Joseph will never forgive me. I'll shoulder the blame. Here, I'm just going to knock this screen down. No, oh. don't odds my life. No, he's coming. He's here. No. Oh. Oh. Lady Teasel. By all that's wonderful. Lady Teasel, by all that's horrible. <laughs> Sir Peter, this is one of the prettiest French milliners I ever saw. Oh, egad, you seem to have all been diverting yourselves here at hide and seek, and I don't know who is out of the secret. Shall I beg your ladyship to inform me? But not a word, all frozen, all mute. Well, though I can make nothing of the affair, I have no doubt but you perfectly understand each other, so I'll leave you to yourselves. Brother, I'm sorry to find you have given this worthy man grounds for so much uneasiness. Sir Peter, there's nothing in the world so noble as a man of sentiment. <laughs> Sir Peter, notwithstanding, I confess that appearances are against me. If you will afford me your patience, I am sure I shall explain everything to your satisfaction. If you please, sir. Fact is, sir, that Lady Teasel, knowing my pretensions to your ward, Mariah, I say, Sir, that Lady Teasel being apprehensive of the jealousy of your temper and knowing my friendship to the family, she, sir, called here in order that I might explain those pretensions. But on your coming, being apprehensive, as I said, she withdrew. 
And this, you may depend on it, is the whole truth of the matter. A very clear account, upon my word. <laughs> and I dare swear the lady will vouch for every article of it. For not one word of it, Sir Peter. What? Don't you think it worthwhile to agree in the lie? There is not one syllable of truth in what that gentleman has told you. Oh, I believe you upon my soul, madam. Stop, madam, will you betray me? Good, Mr. Hypocrite, by your leave, I will speak for myself. Aye, let her alone, sir. She'll make out a better story than you without prompting. Hear me, Sir Peter. I came hither on no matter relating to Mariah and even ignorant of this gentleman's designs on her. But I came seduced by his pretended passion at least to listen to his dishonorable love, not to sacrifice your honor to his lust. Well, now I believe the truth is coming indeed. Woman's mad. No, sir, she has recovered her senses only miserably too late. Sir Peter, I do not expect you ever to forgive me. But the tenderness you expressed for me when I am sure you could not think I was a witness to it has penetrated so to my heart that had I left the place without the shame of this discovery, my future life should have spoken the sincerity of my gratitude. As for that smooth-tongued bastard, I behold him now in a light so truly despicable that I shall never again respect myself for having listened to him. So good day to you both. Notwithstanding all this, Sir Peter, heaven knows. That you are a villain, and so I leave you to your conscience, sir. You are too rash, Sir Peter. You, you shall hear me. The man who shuts out conviction by refusing to tell oh, for God's sake, Joseph, shut up! <laughs> I must say, Broly, I was not sure what to expect upon entering this house, but I, I could never have foreseen pure evasion. Where the devil is he off to in such a rush? Uh, that was Joseph, was it not? It was, Sir Oliver. But I think you are come a little too abruptly. His nerves are so weak that the sight of a poor relation like Mr. Stanley may be too much for him. A plague of his nerves, yet yeah, yeah, this is he whom Sir Peter extols as a man of the most benevolent way of thinking. As to his thinking, I can't pretend to decide, but I believe there is no sentiment Mr. Joseph holds truer than that charity begins at home, as I'm sure you're about to discover. But hark, here he comes. I mustn't seem to interrupt you. Sir, I beg you 10,000 pardons for keeping you a moment waiting. Mr. Stanley, I presume? At your service. Sir, I beg you will do me the honor to sit down. I entreat you, sir. Oh, dear, sir. <laughs> There's no occasion. Too civil by half. I have not the pleasure of knowing you, Mr. Stanley, but I am extremely happy to see you look so well. You were closely related to my mother, I think. Uh, I was, sir, so closely that I fear my present poverty may do discredit to her wealthy children, as I should not have presumed to trouble ye. Dear sir, there needs no apology. He that is in distress, though a stranger, has a right to claim kindred with the wealthy. I am sure I wish I was of that class and had it in my power to offer you even a small relief. If your uncle Sir Oliver were here, I should have a friend. I wish he was, sir, with all my heart. He would be a fine advocate. Believe me, sir. Uh, but sir, I imagined his bounty had enabled you to become the agent of his charity. My dear sir, you are strangely misinformed. Sir Oliver is a worthy man, a very worthy sort of man. But avarice, Mr. Stanley, is the vice of age. I will tell you, my good sir, in confidence, what he has done for me has been a mere nothing, though many people have thought otherwise, and I would not contradict his good name. Uh, what, has he never transmitted you enormous stacks of Eastern wealth? Oh, dear sir, nothing of the kind. No, no, a few presents now and then, China shawls, Congo tea, and Indian crackers. A little more, believe me. His gratitude for 12,000 pounds, shawls and crackers. Then I'm sure you have heard of the extravagance of my younger brother Charles, sir. There are few that know and would credit what I have done for him. Not I, for one. 
The sums I have lent him, indeed, I have been exceedingly to blame, was a brotherly weakness in me. However, I don't pretend to defend it, and now feel doubly culpable since it has deprived me of the power of serving you, Mr. Stanley. Damn dissembler. Uh, then, sir, you, you cannot assist me. At present, it grieves me to say that I cannot. But whenever I have the ability, you may depend upon hearing from me. I am extremely sorry. Not more than I am, believe me. To pity without the power to relieve is still more painful than to ask and be denied. Oh, what a lovely sentiment. You leave me deeply affected, Mr. Stanley. William, be ready to open the door. Your most humble and obedient servant, Mr. Joseph. Sir, yours as sincerely. Charles, you are my heir. Oh, impertinent coxcomb. This is one bad effect of a good character. It invites applications from all the gross wretches of the earth. But who comes here? Good day, Mr. Surface. I was apprehensive of interrupting you, sir. Though my business demands immediate attention, as this note will inform you. Always happy to see Mr. Rowley. How many years has it been, Rowley, since you served as steward to my father? Far too many. Mr. Joseph, I mourn the loss of his goodly influence every day. But read, read the message. Oh, Oliver Surface, my uncle arrived at last. He is indeed. <laughs> we have just parted. He's quite well after a speedy voyage and impatient to embrace his worthy nephew. I am astonished and delighted. <laughs> no more am I, truly. <laughs> uh, but now I must be gone to inform your brother Charles and bring him here to meet his uncle. He will be with you in a quarter of an hour. So he says. Well, oh, well, how marvelous. A damned unlucky accident, if ever I knew one. I'll tell Sir Oliver how impatiently you expect him. Oh, do, do, pray, give my best duty and affection. Indeed, I cannot express the sensations I feel at the thought of seeing him. <laughs> it certainly his coming just at this time is the cruelest piece of ill fortune. <laughs> My dear Benjamin, you... Your servant, Mrs. Candor. You have heard, I suppose. Of Lady Teasel and Mr. Surface. And Sir Peter's discovery. The strangest piece of business, to be sure. Well, I was never so surprised in my life. I'm so sorry for all parties, indeed. Now, I don't pity Sir Peter at all. He was so extravagant and partial to Mr. Surface. Mr. Surface? Why was twas with Charles Surface that Lady Teasel was detected? No such thing. Mr. Joseph is the lover. No, no, Charles is the man, but Mr. Joseph brought Sir Peter on purpose to discover them. I tell you, I have it from one who- And I have it from one. Well, who had it from one who had from it- From one directly, but here comes Lady Sneerwell. Perhaps she knows the truth. So, oh, my dear Mrs. Candor, here's a sad affair of our friend Lady Teasel. I'm my dear friend, who would have thought it? Well, there is no trusting to appearances. She was always a bit too lively for me. Indeed, so she was, and too malicious by half. But have you heard the particulars? No, but everybody says that Mr. Surface was- I, there, I told you, Mr. Surface was the man. No, no, indeed. The assignation was with Charles. With Charles? You alarm me, Mrs. Candor. Yes, yes, he was the lover. Mr. Joseph, do him justice, was only the informer. Well, I'll not dispute with you, Mrs. Candor, but be it which it may, I hope that Sir Peter's wound will not- Sir Peter's wound? Oh, mercy! I didn't hear a word of their fighting. Nor I, not a syllable. No? What? No mention of the duel? Not a word. Oh, Lord, yes, yes, they fought before they left the room. Pray, let us hear. Do oblige us with the duel. Sir, says Sir Peter upon the discovery, you are a most ungrateful fellow. I so said to Charles. No, 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 to Mr. Joseph. Now, shh, a, a, a most un, ungrateful fellow, and, and old as I am, sir, says he, I insist on immediate satisfaction. Nay, then it must have been to Charles, for it is very unlikely Mr. Joseph should go to fight in his own house. God's my life, madam, be quiet. I insist on immediate satisfaction, uh, says he. Upon this, Lady Teasel, seeing Sir Peter in such danger, ran out of the room in hysterics, and Charles after her, calling out for heart's horn and water. Then, madam, Joseph and Sir Peter began to fight with swords. 
Uh, with pistols, nephew. Oh, Miss Black. I have some undoubted authority. Then it is all true. Oh, too true indeed, madam. And Sir Peter dangerously wounded. By a stab wound on his left side. Uh, by a bullet lodged in the thorax. Mercy on me, poor Sir Peter. Yes, madam, though Charles would have avoided the matter if he could. Aha! I knew Charles was the person. Nay, my uncle, I see, knows nothing of the matter. I am more interested in this affair than they imagine and must find better information. Oh, but Lady Sneerwell, where, where are you going? Uh, alas, these ladies have such delicate sensibilities. But pray, where is Sir Peter at present? Oh, they brought him hither to his house, and he is currently upstairs, though all his servants are ordered to deny it. And Lady Teasel, I suppose, is attending him. I doubt he will consent to see her. Injured pride is worse than any pistol shot. Or any rapier stab. But heyday, who comes here? Oh, it must be his physician, depend upon it. <clears throat> well, doctor, what hopes? Aye, doctor, how's your patient? Now, doctor, isn't it a wound with a small sword? A bullet lodged in the thorax for a hundred. Doctor, a, a wound with a small sword and a bullet in the thorax? Zooms, are you mad, good people? Perhaps, sir, you are not a doctor. Uh, truly, sir, I am to thank you for my degree if I am. Only a friend of Sir Peter's, then, I presume. But, sir, have you heard of this accident? Not a word. Not of his being dangerously wounded. The devil he is! I run through the body. Ah, shot in the breast, I tell thee! Uh, by one Mr. Joseph Surface. Get it, nephew! I say it was Charles Surface, his younger brother. Ah, what? But, but, what the play you seem to differ strangely in your accounts. However, you both agree that Sir Peter is dangerously wounded. Oh, yes, we agree in that. Yes, I believe there could be no doubt in that. Well, then, upon my word, for a person in that situation, he is the most imprudent man alive, for here he comes, walking as if nothing at all were the matter! Um... What? Odds heart, Sir Peter, you are coming. Good time, I promise you, for we had just given you over for dead. Egad, Sir Peter, this is the most sudden recovery. What, man, what do you do out of bed with a small sword through your body and a bullet lodged in your thorax? A small sword and a bullet? Aye, these two gentlemen would have killed you without law or physic and wanted to, wanted to dub me a doctor to make me an accomplice. Oh, what in the hell is going on? We rejoice, Sir Peter, that the story of the duel is not true and are sincerely sorry for your other misfortune. Oh, so, so it's all over town already. Uh, Though, Sir Peter, you were certainly vastly to blame to marry at all at your years. And, sir, what business is that of yours? Nay, as Sir Peter made so good a husband, sure, he's very much to be pitied. Well, plague on your pity, madam, I desire none of it. However, Sir Peter, you are old and therefore must not mind the laughing and jests you will meet with on the occasion. Sir, I desire to be master in my own house. In fact, I must insist on your leaving it at once. Well, well, we are going, and depend on it, we'll make the best report of you we can. Oh, leave my house! And tell society how badly you have been treated. Leave my house! And how patiently you bear it. Get out! Ugh, you fiends, you vipers, you furies, I call that their own venom would choke them. They are very provoking indeed, Sir Peter. I heard high words. What has ruffled you, Sir Peter? Oh, Zools, what signifies asking? Do I ever pass a day without my vexations? Well, I'm not inquisitive. I came only to tell you that I have seen both my nephews in the manner we proposed. Well, a precious couple they are. Yes, and Sir Oliver is convinced that your judgment was right, Sir Peter. Uh, yes, I find Joseph is indeed the more reasonable man. Aye, aye, and as Sir Peter says, he's a man of sentiment. And acts up to the sentiment he professes. Indeed. <laughs> yeah, a plague on you both. I see by your sniggering you have heard the whole affair. I swear I shall go mad among you all. You and that Sneerwell's blasted school for scandal. Without affectation, Sir Peter, you may despise the ridicule of fools. But I see Lady Teasel going towards the next room. I'm sure you must desire a reconciliation as earnestly as she does. It's my being here prevents her coming to you. Well, well, well look, I'll, I'll leave Honest Rowley's mediate between you, but then you must alter Mr. Joseph's, where I am now returning, if not to reclaim a libertine, at least to expose hypocrisy. A bientôt! Well, shall we follow him? 
Sir Peter. She is not coming here, you see, Rowley. No, but she has left the door of that room open, you perceive. See, she's in tears. Perhaps she desires you should go to her. How dejected she appears. And will you refrain from comforting her? Well, I hardly know. I, certainly a little mortification appears very becoming in a wife. Don't you, don't you think it will do her good to let her pine a little? Oh, this is ungenerous of you. Well, I know not what to think. Do you remember, Rowley, the love letter I found of hers, secretly composed and intended for Charles? A mere forgery, Sir Peter, laid in your way on purpose to discredit her. This is one of the points which I intend Snake shall give you conviction on. Hi, and amen if he can. I. Oh, she looks this way. I. Rowley, I think I'll go to her. Certainly. Oh, so when it is known that we are reconciled, people will laugh at me ten times more. Let them laugh, Sir Peter, and retort their malice only by showing them you are happy in spite of it. Faith, so I will. And if I'm not mistaken, we may yet be the happiest couple in England. Nay, Sir Peter, don't get ahead of yourself. Remember the old proverb, he who once lays aside suspicion. Hold, shall... Master Rowley, if you have any regard for me, never let me hear you utter anything like a sentiment. I have had enough of them to serve me the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> Unthinkable. Will not Sir Peter be reconciled to Charles now and of consequence no longer oppose his union with Mariah? The thought is a distraction to me. Can passion furnish remedy? No, nor cunning neither. Oh, I was a fool, an idiot to league with such a blunderer. Surely, Lady Sneerwell, I am the greatest sufferer, yet you see I bear the accident with faults. Because the disappointment hasn't reached your heart. It was only economic interest that attached you to Mariah. Had you felt for her what I have for that ungrateful libertine, your brother, you should not be able to hide your vexation. But why should your reproaches fall on me for this disappointment? Are not you the cause of it? Was it not enough to pursue Mariah's consent and dowry, but you had to pervert Lady Teasel along the way? Had you not a sufficient indulgence for your roguery in blinding Sir Peter and supplanting your brother? I hate such an avarice of crimes, Joseph. Tis an unfair monopoly and never prosper. Well, well, I admit I have been to blame, but I don't think we're totally defeated, neither. You believe Snake is still on our side and will testify to the rumor of Lady Teasel's affair with Charles? I swear he will. Then we may still have our victory. But hark, this is probably my uncle, Sir Oliver. Retire to that room, Lady Sneerwell. We'll consult further when he's gone. I have no doubt of your abilities, only be constant to one roguery at a time. Will, I will. So, tis confounded hard after such bad fortune being railed at by one's partner in conspiracy. Well, at least my character is so much better than Charles's that I certainly... Hey, Day, what? This is not Sir Oliver, but old Stanley again. Plague on it that he should return to tease me just now. If Sir Oliver should find him here... <clears throat> God's my life, Mr. Stanley. Why have you come back to plague me at this time? You must not stay now, upon my word. Sir, I hear your rich uncle Oliver is expected here, and though the man has been so stingy with you, I'll try what he'll do for me. Sir, it is impossible for you to stay now. Beg pardon, sir. Come any other time, and I promise you shall be assisted. No, Sir Oliver and I must be acquainted. Zunes, sir, I insist on your quitting the room directly. Nay, but I shan't, sir. Sir, I insist on it. Oi, William, show this gentleman out. Now, out, I say. Hey, Day, what's the matter now? Why the devil are you jostling my little broker there? Zunes, brother, don't hurt Mr. Premium. So this charlatan has been with you too, has he? This afternoon. Why, Joseph, you have not been borrowing money too, have you? Borrowing money? What the devil do you mean? 
But egad, brother, we haven't time for clarification. You know we expect Uncle Oliver at any moment. Oh, God, that's true. You mustn't find the broker here, to be sure. Yet Mr. Stanley insists. And Stanley? Why, his name's Premium. No, Stanley. No, Premium. Well, no matter which, but he can't. Aye, aye, Stanley or Premium, tis the same thing as you say for, and I suppose he goes by have a hundred names. All that matters is we get him out. It's death here, sir, Oliver, at the door. Now, I beg you, Mr. Stanley. Aye, aye, and I beg, Mr. Premium. Gentlemen! <laughs> Boys! Sir, by heaven, you shall go! I out with him, certainly! Uh, this violence is more untoward! Tis your own fault! Out with him, to be sure! Oh, my old friend, Sir Oliver! Hey, Dave, what <laughs> in the name of wonder? God's sake, what are you doing? Oh, here are their dutiful nephews to assault their uncle at his first visit. Indeed, Sir Oliver, twas well we came in to rescue you. <laughs> Truly it was, for I perceive, Sir Oliver, the character of old Stanley was of no protection to you. No, nor a premium either. The necessities of the former could not extort a shilling from that benevolent gentleman, and with the other, I stood a chance of faring worse than my ancestors being knocked down without being bid for. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Sir Peter, my friend, and Broly to look on that elder nephew of mine. You know what Joseph has already received from my bounty and how gladly I would have held half my fortune in trust for him. Judge then my disappointment in discovering him to be destitute of truth, charity, and gratitude. Sir Oliver, I should be more surprised at this declaration if I had not myself found him to be selfish, treacherous, and hypocritical. And if the gentleman pleads not guilty to these charges, pray let him call me to the witness box. Oh, nay, madam. If Joseph knows himself, he will consider it the most exquisite punishment that he has known to the world. <laughs> yeah, if they talk this way to honesty, what will they say to me by and by? As for that prodigal, his brother there. Aye, now comes my turn. The damned family pictures will ruin me. Sir Oliver, uncle. You honor me with hearing? Oh, like, what, I suppose you would, you would undertake to vindicate yourself entirely? I trust I could. You can't, so don't bother. Well, Charles, and you will attempt to justify yourself too, I suppose. I had no such intention, sir. You have the portraits. There's evidence enough to convict me, but believe me when I tell you, believe me. But believe me sincere when I tell you that if I do not appear mortified at the exposure of my follies, it is because I feel at this moment the warmest satisfaction in seeing you, my liberal benefactor and dearest uncle. Charles, I believe you. You what now? Give me your hand again, nephew. The ill-looking little fellow of the fireplace has made your peace. But I believe, Sir Oliver, here is one whom Charles is still more anxious to be reconciled to. Oh, yes, I've heard of his attachment there, and with the young lady's pardon, if I construe that blush correctly. Well, child, go on. You are free to confess your feelings at last, for you know we are going to be reconciled to Charles. Sir, I have little to say, but that I shall rejoice to hear that Mr. Charles is happy for me. Whatever claim I have to his affections, I willingly resign to one who has a better title. What? Mariah. No, sir, that was not an invitation for you to speak to me. Egad, but I will. Who on this earth, madam, do you imagine has a better title or more right to my foolish heart than thee? Oh, foolish, yes, that is one good word, but I can think of several others. Where the devil is all of this coming from? Have my previous follies caught up with us so close to the finish line? Did not I tell you when we began that you had better choose anyone, anything, than a libertine? Answer me, did I ever give you a false impression of my past? No. Did I fail to convey that I knew I could never deserve you? No. And did you fall in love with me anyway? Charles, my boy. I fell in love with a man who had renounced a life of debauchery and chosen instead to commit his wayward soul where it would be kept and loved. That is, with yourself. So I thought. And so I did. Shall we call in Lady Sneerwell and let her testify to the veracity of your honor? Lady Sneerwell. Aye, indeed, brother. I'm afraid the injuries you have done to that good lady can no longer be concealed. Hold you there. I will let her in. Oh, now, what injuries? Has the world gone mad? 
Oh, centuries ago, nephew. I'm surprised this is the first you've heard of it. Ah, oh, another French milliner, egad. Joseph keeps one in every room, I suppose. Ungrateful Charles. Well, may you be surprised and feel for the indelicate situation which your perfidy has forced me into. Pray, uncle, is this another plot of yours? For as I have life, I don't understand it. I believe, sir, the evidence of one person more shall make it extremely clear. And that person, I imagine, is Mr. Snake. Rowley, you were so perfectly right to bring him with us. Pray let him appear. Walk in, Mr. Snake. I thought his testimony might be wanted. However, it happens, unluckily, that he comes to confront Lady Sneerwell and not to support her. What? A villain? Treacherous to me at the last? Well, speak, fellow, have you two conspired against me? I beg your ladyship 10,000 pardons. You paid me extremely liberally for the lie in question, but I unfortunately have been paid double to speak the truth. <laughs> the torment of shame and disappointment on you all. Behold, Lady Snarewell, before you go, let me thank you for the trouble you and that gentleman have taken in forging love letters from me to Charles and answering them yourself. What? What? And let me also request you make my respects to the scandalous college of which you are president and inform them that Lady Teasel novitiate begs leave to return the diploma they granted her as she is resolved to leave off practice and kill characters no longer. Provoking insolent! May your husband live these 50 years! Dunes, what a fury. A malicious creature indeed. Not, hey, 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 not for that last wish. Oh, no. 50 years would be too few. Uh, well, Joseph, and what have you to say now? Sir, I am so confounded to find that Lady Sneerwell could be guilty of supporting Mr. Snake in this manner. I know not what to say. However, lest her revengeful spirit should prompt her to injure my brother, I had better follow her directly. Moral to the last drop. Aye, and marry her, sir, if you can. Oil and vinegar, you'll do very well together. Please, Sir Oliver, there needs no persuasion now to reconcile your nephew and Mariah. Aye, aye, that's as it should be. And Egad will have the wedding tomorrow morning. Thank you, dear uncle. The hell, you rogue! Don't you ask the girl's consent first? Oh, I've had that for ages, a whole minute. For shame, Charles. 30 seconds at most. Uh, 45. You know, perhaps I shan't marry you after all? Fine, 30 seconds. But you owe me a very eloquent apology for doubting the sincerity of my love and yelling at me in front of all of these fine people. Only if you will oblige me with an apology for doubting the validity of my caution and catechizing me in front of all these fine people. Yes, we will be married tomorrow. Not a moment too soon, I think. Ah, oh, my dear rogues, may your love for each other never know abatement. And may you live as happily together as Lady Teasel and I intend to do. Rowley, my old friend, I'm sure you congratulate me, and I suspect, too, that I owe you much. Oh, you do indeed, Charles. There's nothing I would not do again a thousand times, Master. I, honest Rowley, always said you would reform. Why, as to reforming, Sir Peter, I'll make no promises. And that I take to be a proof that I intend to set about it. Very clever. But I can promise one thing, which is to love this lady beyond the reasonable measure for a husband of this or of any age. And that perhaps will be enough to convince her to endure me. Fond, reckless man. Do you not fear the scandal it will cause when the world hears you love me too much? Not half so much as I fear my failure to deserve that rotten reputation. I'll make sure you are as worthy of it as I am. Ah, oh, here's a marriage vow worth blessing. May you both live scandalously ever after. 